The following interview was conducted with Richard Stewart, the Director Emeritus of the now Center for Career Opportunities, former University Placement Office, for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on, February, on Thursday, February 28, 2008, at Stewart Center, room uh, B26. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about where you were born in your early years and parents. Well, okay, I was uh, born in uh, Chester, Pennsylvania, which is outside of Philadelphia, a little south on the river from downtown Philadelphia. I uh, grew up in Upper Darby, which is a suburb of Philadelphia. Came to Purdue the first time in 1949 when my brother enrolled as a freshman here in engineering and uh, fell in love with it and followed his four years at school. And the year he graduated, 1953, I entered as a freshman and I was here as an undergraduate until 59. I was one of those students that changed majors and wasn't sure what I wanted to do. And uh, well, Tell us a little about what high school, where did you go to high school, how went, large it was, and yeah, it was, you decided uh, to, and why you decided it was, to come uh, High school was uh, a very large high school, Upper Darby. I think it's one of the largest in the state of Pennsylvania now. It's suburban, western suburban Philadelphia. And uh, I think we had pretty close to uh, Oh, 2,000 students, and this was in 1953, and that was just for the top three grades, uh, 10, 11, and 12. Uh, so I did have a fairly good preparation, but like many students found that uh, college-level work is a lot more work right. than, than high school work. Were there any student activities or athletics? Or well, yeah, I played football on an uh, undefeated team that was champion of the Philadelphia League, and uh, or the good. suburban Philadelphia League. and. I thought about trying out for football at Purdue until I went to a practice one day, and uh, I was little, uh, but I was slow, and so I didn't really fit into the Purdue <laughs> scheme of things. Now, all 170 pounds of me wasn't going to make it in the Big Ten even back in 1953. Yeah. So, so you came to Purdue when, 53? 53, and I wanted to be an engineer because my dad was a mechanical engineer, my brother had graduated in mechanical engineering, and I thought, well, gee, I guess that's what I'm supposed to do, but I found after about two years that I really wasn't cut out for engineering. I'd probably be a junior now if I'd stayed in engineering all that time, so uh, I... What was campus like and did you live on campus? Tell us a little bit about your experience. I lived in a place called O.P. Terry House on Waldron Street. at 608 Waldron. It's now a, f a fraternity, but it was donated to the university back during the Depression by the wife of the first um, doctor for the university, Dr. Terry. And uh, she wanted it to be a residence for male students at that time. And there were 36 students selected out of Cary Hall Pool, and we lived almost the life of a fraternity, but we had everything done for us, like cooking and cleaning and so forth, by Cary Hall staff. So it really was the best of two worlds. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Did you live there the whole time you were here? No, I, <laughs> I lived there for two years, and then uh, had what, a freshman and sophomore year? Freshman and sophomore year, and then uh, I came back for summer school and uh, met my wife. In fact, this morning I had a cup of coffee in the sweet shop, and that's where I had met my wife. She was here from California for the summer, and uh, we've been married 52 years, so I guess it worked out. Yeah, that's right. Did, was she, did she become a, was she a student here? She took summer classes. She had graduated oh. from nursing school. Her sister's husband was a Ph.D. Uh, um, postdoctoral student in physics, biophysics, and so she decided to come out for the summer and stay with her sister and take a course or two. And we met at the sweet shop over Super. a cup of coffee. Yeah. Uh, what student clubs would you participate in when you're here? Uh, tell us what well, the campus the was like. Well, the first couple of years, you know, I did the uh, intramural athletics stuff uh, that you do when you're tied into Cary Hall and some of the some of the social stuff. Ran for an office and didn't make it, and that was probably a good thing. But uh, then when I was married, I had another agenda. Uh, Did you get married while you were here then? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. In fact, uh, my wife and I had our first date on July the 10th. I'd known her for a couple of weeks. I had our first date July 10th, and on uh, July 17th, we were out for a drive, or 16th, I, or, I'm sorry, July 26th, we were out for a drive, and I made a comment about how much part of Indiana reminded me of Pennsylvania, and I asked her, would you like to come there? And she says, I couldn't do that. We're not married. We drove a little further, and I said, well, let's get married. So a week later, a week and a half later, she went to California and went to Pennsylvania. We didn't see each other until three days before the wedding when I introduced myself to her father and said, I'm here to marry your daughter. Oh, very so nice. We came back, and I was a student. She, Being a nurse, she taught nursing at St. Elizabeth Hospital for three years. It was way before Purdue had a nursing program. Sure. 
But they had a nursing school there, didn't they, they at the hospital? They still do at the, right. the hospital. And in those days, uh, hospital-based nursing schools were very common. And then when Purdue under Helen Johnson got the uh, first associate degree program, my wife started teaching there and spent 28 years teaching sure. in, on the nursing right. faculty. Um, after, what was your, did you do some graduate work? Yeah, after, after, you, after getting my degree, which was in 59, a baccalaureate in, in industrial economics, uh, I went into the Army like many young men did. That was also one of the activities that uh, male students in those days had to be in, at least in two years of ROTC. And I got a draft notice and decided maybe I'd take two more years. So I was commissioned in the Corps of Engineers. I spent some time at Fort Belvoir and uh, decided I'd go to graduate school because I still wasn't sure of my career path. I came back to Purdue and uh, it was very interesting the way I got here because I had a written to many graduate schools from Penn State all the way to Cal Berkeley and the responses I got were really interesting. In what uh, way? Well I didn't identify where I had gone to school, what my degree was, I just said I was a lieutenant in the, in the Army and I was going to separate in February of 1961 and I was interested in the following things and I got responses that ranged from Berkeley saying when you make up your mind send us 75 cents and we'll send you a catalog. And Penn State said, well, you don't seem to know what you want, so think about it some more. The only school that responded, and I did not tell them I was a Purdue graduate, was Purdue. And old Doc Owen, who ran the industrial relations program, wrote back a personal letter and said, we have a pro small program of interdisciplinary studies between sociology, psychology, economics, et cetera, and you create your own program. And I said, well, that sounds for me. And we'd left our furniture here with a, uh, an instructor that I had in English, Bill Hastings, because he was from my hometown outside of Philadelphia. I'd worked for him in the summer painting houses and that sort of thing. So our furniture was here, and I called up my old landlord where he, we had been for four years. Uh, if you are familiar with the West Lafayette area, there was a grocery store and uh, uh, gas station at the corner of Robinson and Salisbury, a two-story white building, Skelton's Grocery. Well, we lived there for three years, and then we went in the Army called the old landlord and said, uh, gee, I'm coming out of the Army and we're coming back to graduate school. Do you know of a place to live? And he said, guess what? Our apartment upstairs is available. Why don't you move right back in? So my furniture was here. <laughs> and my first uh, experience with the placement service, I said, well, gee, I, it's too late to get into classes because classes have started, but I'll look for a job at the placement service. And in those days, it was called placement service for men. Well, I've learned that in many of the interviews. Yeah, and there was a placement service for women. That Which was affiliated with the Dean of Women's Office. Dean of Women's, yeah. right. And so I was going to look for a job, and I knew my wife as a, a former faculty member uh, at St. E could get a job either teaching or in the hospital, which she did as supervisor of pediatrics. Went in to see Doc Owen and introduced myself and said, well, I'll, I'll start summer school. And he said, well, why don't you start now? And I said, well, you know, classes started two weeks ago. He said, well, I'm sure you can catch up. And besides, how would you like a job working for the Federal Reserve Bank? Because I don't know whether you know this or not, but on campus there was and may still be a security office for the 7th District of Federal Reserve out of Chicago. Huh. Every single transaction that took place in the 7th District was duplicated and mailed to s overnight to Lafayette. And in the basement of the new Lilly Hall, where there wasn't even concrete on the floor, there were boards across the, the What hall the is this now? Uh, well, I guess it's Lily Hall now. Oh, okay. Over across the, sure. the South Street. So I worked in that for a year, uh, doing filing for the Federal Reserve, and then the auditors would come in every so often unannounced to see if, could we really reproduce everything that happened in the Federal Reserve 7th District if there was a natural or man-made disaster and put us out of business in, in Chicago. So. Uh, how was the? What was it? How did you reproduce it or make copies? Well, it was sent to us copies of uh, oh. punch cards for the computer, okay. uh, copies of all of the correspondence, and it was the days before computers. Oh, but sure. We had teletypes for things right. that had to come in, so we had a couple and of you, teletypes. Were you filing the cards then? Yep. And we fired. <laughs> I never want to see another punch card in my life, but it was a great job because uh, we had a certain amount of work to do and were paid for so many hours. But it, you did it sort of at your own leisure. Sure. And if you were busy studying, you would do it at night, or if you were busy on Friday, you would work the weekend. And as long as you got the work done, that was fine. And so I uh, worked there for a year, and then Doc Owen called me again and said, you know, the placement service for men has a vacancy for a graduate intern, and it's a full-time position, but it will require a two-year commitment. 
they don't want turnover, but somebody has left in the middle and they're kind of up against it. So would you go over an interview? I interviewed Lynn Kaysen, who was the then director, was hired by Lynn, and uh, he was a great boss. I, I, his mother is still living, I believe, or I'm sorry, his wife is still living in Westminster. She's like 102 and still very active. But I worked for Lynn for a number of years, and uh, after about four years, he said, you know, I'm tired of doing the turnover business with graduate students. Would you like to go from a graduate assistant to a full-time assistant? I thought, well, <laughs> why not? You know, I like what I'm doing. What was the, uh, what were some of your duties? What was the My placement responsibility office? And where were you point? located? We were uh, located here in uh, Stewart Center. Uh, the same spot? The same spot. Um, and this was just for men? Just for men. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's interesting because uh, it turns out that when my wife and I decided to do this quick marriage in 1956, uh, we did a lot of planning for our wedding in the study room on the first floor, which is now the placement service. And when I came back and was offered a job there, I looked around and I thought, gee, there's something familiar about this room. But of course, they built Stewart Center all around it, so it was very different at that point. Oh, sure. And uh, so anyway, I worked for about four years, and then I, Lynn, uh, interesting story, Don Mallett was the vice president in those days. You, you reported, that was a reporting structure. Lynn reported to, to Don Mallett. And I was at my desk one day in 1965, and I got a phone call and said, this is Dr. Mallett's office, he's wondering if you could come over and see him. Well, the vice president didn't call, you know, four-year employees very often, I thought, uh-oh. So I went over to Don Mallett's office and I walked in and there sat my boss, Lynn Kaysen. And I must have turned a very pale shade because my, my, uh, my boss said, you haven't done anything wrong, just sit down, we want to talk to you. And uh, Don Mallett said, well, Lynn Kaysen has decided after 24 years as the director here that he's going to retire. Okay. Next statement was, and I'd like you to be his replacement. Now, today, if a director retires, there's a search, and there's this, and there's that, and the, but that's the way things were done in, in the 1960s, and he just said, would you take over in July of 1966? And I didn't and have to think too long. And that's how you got too, started. That's, didn't think too long, but I had been there, you know, five years already, sure. and had done... Had you finished your degree at the same time? Well, I right? had I had finished, uh, of course, my undergraduate, and I had sort of taken it easy on getting the master's, but I did finish it, so I had both my bachelor's in industrial economics and my master's in industrial relations. And uh, was kind of getting into the community, a lot of things, and it just seemed like a good place to be. Sure. And uh, I never regret it. It was, it was a great move for me. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about some of the things that, you know, what the challenges and changes, and let's oh, talk a little bit goodness. about the Center for Career Opportunities. Yeah. Well, actually, it started out, as you may know, when Dean Potter set it up as a personnel office for engineering students. And then in 1950-something, 50 51, something like that, when Lynn Kaysen was named the director, uh, they made it the placement service for men because the Dean of Women's Office felt that women needed a little something extra that, that wouldn't be provided by an engineering-oriented office. So we had the two offices. Um, it was truly a placement office. The main thrust was getting jobs for students, both part-time, summer, and full-time employment. And my, my initial role in that was to work with students for part-time placement. When you were, when when you were was, interning. When I was uh, interning and also the first year or so after that. But there were only three of us in the office. There were John Feinler, uh, assistant director, and myself, both reporting to Lynn. So it was a very small staff. And our role was how many employers can we bring, how many interviews can we get, and how many jobs. And it was very driven by the job market. And so that meant good times and bad times. And uh, sure. it was um, very, very much a paper and pencil and typewriter operation. Um, you were saying was that Potter set up for engineers, but wasn't, was the placement office for men for all, all, all yeah, academic departments? Yeah, that was the first attempt to, to branch yeah. out, but it still was for men. So it was for liberal arts or humanities, social science, and education majors, as sure. they were called then, and science majors and undergraduates and so forth. But teaching had a separate thing, they didn't they? They did have a separate one. And right. There's an interesting story yeah, there. Yeah, I'll get into that, uh, but I thought that at the time. It, it was kept separate. And agriculture did a lot of their own uh, placement under Dave Fendler, who you may remember, <laughs> and Vern, uh, Vern Freeman. Freeman. Yeah, they, they kind of held on to that. And that, that was all right, uh, because in the early 60s, the Sputnik had taken place and the demand for technical people were just 
it was just going out of sight. In fact, there was such a demand for p technical PhDs that our uh, office, uh, under Lynn's direction, decided to set up a special time just for PhDs to interview. So the first week of the year for recruiting was restricted to PhDs in science and engineering. And that mushroomed into two weeks and then almost three weeks because the demand was so high and we just couldn't find enough students to fill the space demands. And of course, the, the Vietnam War was just on the horizon. So it was a very, sure. very busy time in corporate America and they were willing to come here and scour up. What was the recruiter like? How did you arrange the scheduling and things in those early days? <laughs> Everything was done by paper and telephone. And in fact, with the telephones, we would always call the employers collect because Purdue didn't have the budget for us to call companies in California and New York and Florida. There was no Suvon. There was no Suvon, and there certainly wasn't an internet, That's and there right. wasn't uh, our first uh, reproductive machine was the old fax machine, you know, the heat machine, and those things would last a while, and then they'd kind of disintegrate right. on us. And so uh, everything we did was pretty much personalized. I'd, we'd talk one-on-one -on -one and write down in a little book. I still have several of the books with the dates and how we mechanically tracked them from putting it on a calendar book, putting an O out when we made the schedule available to students to come in, first come, first serve, and sign their name. And then when the schedule was ready to be produced for the employer, we put a K by it and a red mark. So everything was OK for that employer. And we were doing uh, quite a few thousand interviews a year, and it was all That's done manually good. by three of the us. The market was pretty heavy then. The strong. market was so heavy, and uh, that that really led me to start thinking about how can we do this better. And, and as things developed technologically, when I took over in 1966, uh, two things happened. One, we changed the name. Uh, Don Mallet decided. Placement service for men just wasn't inclusive enough, particularly since everybody thought only engineering men. Well, there were more women thinking of engineering, but we included the management and the humanities and all that sort of thing. And so the placement service for men became the university placement service, but the thrust was still just jobs for students. And there were just three of us doing all this, but the numbers of students compared to the 10,000 on campus in 1953 when I came here was growing exponentially it seemed to us and uh, I can recall somewhere in the 60s there was a survey of faculty and staff saying what's the ultimate and optimum size for the university to be in terms of students and I think almost unanimously we said don't go over 20,000 students. You know, <laughs> we well, passed that, they picked that number, some time right? ago. But we needed to improve um, efficiency a little bit because it was getting harder and harder to do all the, you know, we kept hard copies of resumes and we had 20 on each student and so every time a student would sign his or her name, there were a few women using the service, we'd have to physically go and get a resume and put changes. it in a folder, very labor intensive. At this time, you're, uh, you opened it up to women though, is that? Yes. Okay. Yes. It always had been technically, but in reality with mainly students from uh, economics and, and that sort of thing, as well as engineers and science, there weren't that many female students, right. not at all. Uh, the enrollment was, was, was on the lower very side. Very small, very small. Yeah. But I was looking in 1966 for ways to make things more efficient. And I, I remember one of the things that I thought was really a lot of fun, IBM had come out with an electric typewriter. And so instead of typing individual letters to several hundred companies of confirming things and setting things up, we had a thing called an autotypist that I had purchased. And it ran like an old player piano. And we would make up what our letters should look like. And they would punch tape into it. And then by air, like a, a player piano, it would type the letter I wanted with a blank when it came to somewhere to insert something unique like a date or a time or something like that. and then the, So the typist productivity went way up from doing the whole oh, letter sure. to just doing... <laughs> Touch typing, type. whatever. Yeah. And uh, <clears throat> so that was... Um, that was a good move forward. It, it was. It was It was noisy, so we had to buy a soundproofing box because no one else could get work done <laughs> right. because this automatic thing going chug, 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 chug. All those so letters and things, news. yeah. And it was way before computers and, sure. and that sort of thing. But it was, it was interesting. But it speeded up the production it and made it did. a lot easier on, from a yeah. workflow yeah. angle. And I did some other things that some of them were more well met than others. Like uh, since we were doing the telephone so much, I thought, well, why don't we put our phone number on the uh, letterhead? 
Well, the purchasing department had a fit because it was against their policy to have phone numbers because after all they might change. So I got into an interesting discussion and some heated words with uh, the purchasing <laughs> department who finally Fred Ford sorted out and said, you know, <laughs> let's be reasonable. They do their business by the phone mostly, so let's put the phone number on return instead of having to type it in. I did a time and motion study to see how long, before we got the autotypers, how long it would take to type in a phone number and calculated how many letters we sent out and how many minutes were lost by doing that. And I know the purchasing director got very angry and said, I don't try to tell you how to run placement. Don't you try to tell me how to run purchasing. <laughs> so Fred always. Ford had to settle that one, which I thought was kind of problems. stupid. Yeah. So anyway, uh, we started thinking about computer things in the mid-60s also. When we kind of, I spent about 20 years involved with our national association in, in many computer programs uh, trying to get computers on board. And we were one of the leaders in the country in terms of doing that. And what made the changes that uh, brought that along? And the whole recruiting process has well, kind of changed, Well, there too. were a couple of things. It was a lot easier to have the data in a computer and print it on demand. Than, oh, I, I, we had just file cabinets with 20 resumes for each student. So it just took up a lot of space and a lot of paper. It was a lot easier to say, well, Johnny Jones has an appointment with so-and-so. Let's print his resume for that interview and not worry about having 19 more that he might not use. Um, it just, uh, you know, I was always looking for ways to do things faster. Now, in 66, we also did bring in the women's placement because Danita Stowball, who was working over in the Dean of Students office, who had started with me about the same time, she was in Dean of Students and I was in placement, she became my associate director, or assistant director for uh, women's activities, I guess. And, uh, that was that she came of, over from she came over from the dean of student dean of women's office. Okay, and uh, her main thrust was to find ways to get women to use this new service. And I had tried from 1966 for a lot of years to get educational placement to see the fact that not every education major teaches, and not every engineer does engineering. Some of them go into teaching, and the same with science and so forth. And I would call on the powers that be in the education department and they'd politely say, well, thank you, but no thank you, we'll do it ourselves. That lasted until Marilyn Herring became the director, or the uh, dean of, of education. And shortly after she was here, we had some budget crunches, and I forget the exact year, but Marilyn called up one day and said, I'd like to come talk with you. And her first question was, why do we have these two placement offices? And I said, well, I've offered since 1966 and to. it's always been your predecessors, <laughs> so you can ask them, but I don't know why it didn't make sense, and we agreed. So in, in uh, that year, we, we also took educational placement and um, brought someone on board to be a specialist for education sure, majors. Right. And, uh, and that's worked out pretty well. Yes, it yeah, has. Right. Yeah. Um, now, you, uh, sorry, um, once the computer thing in, then, mm -hmm. then you went to the web and... Some yes. of the changes over uh, time well, one in of the, the 80s. One of the main changes, <coughs> we were the first school, to my knowledge, one of my graduate students had developed a way to proportionally print resumes. It used to be that it was nothing but a data sheet, and it looked very computerish. Sure. And I said to this young man, Charlie, I said, can you do anything with this? Well, he came up with a way of no matter how much data you had, he would spread it out so that it looked like a resume, and he got his picture and so forth on the front page of one of the computer machine magazines because that was a innovative thing and I know I was having an argument with my um, counterpart at Iowa State and he, he was a big computer guy but he we were at a meeting and he said well you can't use computer they just they, they're they're no good for this purpose and I handed him one that Charlie had printed and I said what does this look like and he said well these look like and he paused and he says these look like resumes <laughs> and so we were one of the first to, to do that and at the same time, we started thinking about doing things on the internet. And we were one of five schools who started out with our database available to any employer who was uh, able to get internet stuff. It was amazing. Uh, I had this naive thought that we would spread this by companies sponsoring schools. Well, it turned it was the other way around. The schools were so far ahead of corporations. I'd, talked to a number of corporations and they had the internet service and didn't realize they could get on and get resumes. Get a link to it. Yeah, uh -huh. we were way ahead of, of them at that point. And um, it just tended to increase. But I think the big change was when the economy changed and employers no longer could just send recruiters 
to talk to any student they wanted to see, or that wanted to see them. The employers wanted to be in control and say, look, I, I can't talk to every student who wants to see me, and I want a choice in this whole thing. And we had been very dedicated to students making the choice and employers, you know, Going ahead and interviewing. Yeah. Right, sure. And some companies <clears throat> went along with that, but some companies said, you know, we financially, as you are growing bigger and our needs are shrinking, we can't afford to do business that way. So they went into what was called pre screening at that point. And they only wanted to see certain students that they wanted to review their paperwork ahead of time, not just show up on campus and wonder who was going to sit across the table from them. Sure. Okay. So. The, uh, the scheduling changed too. Uh, yes, didn't it, it did. Um, <clears throat> this is one of the things that, w in order to speed up the scheduling process, we did move to student requesting interviews by mark sense. And so instead of us having to manually look at what the student wrote down, his name and his major and graduation date, and check it to make sure it's what the employer wanted, we put it on mark sense and then scan them, and the mark sense thing would then create the, s the schedule for us. And it was almost totally foolproof. And um, may I take a break and have a drink here? On yeah, oh, please do, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. <coughs> you can drink while you're talking, that's okay. It was a very difficult time in, in many ways because things were getting tight at the university in terms of finances, and we were all looking for ways to make things more efficient. And I had a young woman doing data entry who could not hear and did not speak. And so she was never distracted by people talking about last night's TV or what did your kids do or something. Absolutely wonderful employee. She had been with me for nine years doing data entry. But I had to make a cut. And I know the president then, and I won't say his name, but said Purdue never laid anybody off. Well, yes, we did, because my choice was to get rid of somebody or cut back services. And so I had to let her go. And that was one of the hardest things I've ever done. I spent, yeah, we spent money bringing an interpreter up, signer, because she did American Sign Language. Carol Barrett, my associate director, and I sat down and tried to explain to this young woman who had been with us almost nine years that you're not going to have a job anymore. And we bought uh, a scanner. Mm. For one well, how do you cost. handle when the market goes down and the job, uh, you know, yeah. That's a challenge. It's a lot more fun when they're coming to you than you have to go to them. And that leads into another problem that we've had historically in our business, and that is getting employers out of the mindset that there's only one major that can do a certain job. And of course, the liberal arts and humanities people forever have been saying, what's wrong with our good students? Well, there's nothing wrong with them, but employers are looking for a marketable skill today, accounting, computer science, engineering, you know, maybe sales. And uh, I know when uh, several of the deans of humanities and I would get together, uh, they would say, well, why is it that the engineers are getting all the, what are you doing wrong because the engineers get all the interviews? And I don't think I ever made an impact on some of them about the reality. It's hard to. Yeah, it is. And, it's hard and it was not because they were dumb students or bad students there or just wasn't unwilling. It. Right. But employer's mindset. And so we were always looking for ways, even in good times. In fact, it was easier in good times to say, well, yeah, we can't give you an engineer, but do you really need an engineer to do this job? It sounds to me, or it seems to me from looking at your do job description, that a bright student could learn to do this. Sure. And right. it was true. And so in good times, it, it did open up some opportunities for humanities students or even management students who wouldn't have been considered, but we've always hired engineers to do this and we're always going to hire engineers kind of thing. <laughs> we did not have a budget to go out and try to, you know, convince. I, I wasn't out on the road selling our students. And there were times when I wished that I could have, but uh, just wasn't in the budget to do sure. that sort of thing. What about, have, they, or have you always had job fairs and career fairs? <coughs> no, those, well, yes and no. Okay. Way back in the 60s, uh, Lynn K or in the 50s, Lynn Kaysen had started a program of job fairs for the whole university, and they held them in the armory. And then that kind of fell out of favor. And uh, for, uh, for everybody? For everybody. Oh. It just Would there were, uh, recruiters be there, too? Yeah, oh, okay. yeah. It was a job fair. We'd bring in employers, and they'd set up in tables. And then in the uh, 70s, 60s, 70s, we started that program up again, but it was mainly at the initiative of the schools. 
we had so many schools that we were responsible for that we couldn't set one up for one without setting them up for sure. all nine schools on campus. And so engineering, being the big dog, decided they'd have the engineering fair, and we offered our services as advisors and our mailing lists and stuff like that so that they could hold the... You're uh, referring to the industrial round table that yes, they run every yes, year, which is yes. really big. Yeah. But nursing yeah. came along, had one, and science had one, and management had one. We just didn't have the staff or the resources to run all of them, so we said, hey, we'll be consultants. We can work in conjunction, we probably. Can, we can help you any way we can, but we can't run it for you. Right. And what Lynn had done in the in the 50s was for the whole campus, but it ended up being all for engineers anyway. So. But it was a lot smaller. The campus But it was wasn't. a lot smaller in terms of students. <laughs> they could fill the army. Right. They could fill the army. Uh, so those those career fairs were another way that employers found uh, they could market their. You know, employers were always looking for how do we get the attention of the, of the students we want, and when we said, well, we can let you select your own out of the group that we will tell you has an interest in you, uh, the way to get the interest is to be on campus so General Motors would come and do a dog and pony show and GE and so forth. And, uh, yeah. Some of those bigger companies used to bring a big crew of people. Oh, is yes. That, uh, yes. GM, for example, oh, yes. I know, <laughs> having, having attended some of their the yes. functions. Uh, in fact, my older daughter uh, was a mechanical engineering student. Uh, and works has worked for GM at Delco over in Kokomo for 20 some years so uh, uh, it was interesting uh, having your daughter interviewing and she never wanted to be my daughter as far as the recruiter she wanted to do it on herself and uh, so she wouldn't tell them and when she took the job with uh, GM which was Delco at that point uh, Bruce Parkinson, our basketball player from years ago, was in charge. He was of one of the, I used to come here yeah. for recruiting. Right. And so he was the one that hired her. And I never said anything about my daughter or even interviewed with him. Uh, but a friend of mine, Pete Verrucchi from one of the steel companies, had a daughter who started at Delco at the same time. And they were the first fewest <laughs> female engineers. They got to be friends. So my buddy from, in, uh, from, uh, Bethlehem Steele went over to see his daughter when he was on a business trip, and he went to Bruce's office, and he said, oh, I'm here to see my, my daughter, Meg Veruki, and he said, oh, yeah, I know Meg. He said, and I also would like to talk to Marta Stewart, and he, she said, Marta Stewart, um, I don't think I know her, because she's married by then. Well, Bruce called me up, and he said, why didn't you tell me I had married your daughter? And I said, because I didn't want you to hire her because of me, I think, and she didn't want that either, so, but she's uh, done very well with Jesus. Is she married to Bruce? No, she was no, I mean, she, she when she got married, her name changed from right, Stewart, and okay. so she, she, before she graduated, she was married, uh -huh. and so she didn't have the Stewart name, and I never said anything, and in the interview, so she never said it anything. In. Yeah. So Bruce didn't know for probably six, eight months that uh, he'd hired her Interesting. Do you get the larger companies? How do you, what about the smaller and the middle size? That's, That's always been a problem. Uh, there has been a, f I guess, a urban myth is the only way I could, that we don't want them, and the reality is we'd like to have more of them. and. Uh, if you recall the problems we had over CIA recruiting and the demonstrations in front of our office that blocked your egress and ingress, yeah. um, we had a, an open forum in Low Playhouse one night in January and packed the place with a should we have placement or shouldn't we have it? And one of the and I was there not. What was the form? I mean, the form was for placement, or for should there be a placement office? Because oh. it was followed a demonstration in my office oh. and uh, about the recruiting. About the Recru recruiting, and so there was a faculty or two and a student saying we shouldn't have placement, and there was Don Pearlberg and some students saying we should, and they debated it and then took questions from the audience. I was not personally on the stage, but I was in the front row as a resource person, and one of the first questions was, "Well, placement service or the." Uh, it was still called placement service then, uh, doesn't want small employers. You know, you're, you're just catering to General Motors and General Electric. And so I stood up and said, well, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you know, that is not true. We would love to have more, and I don't care who they are if they're a legitimate employer. And uh, that was probably the most difficult time of my life uh, in placement is to sit and watch your office being debated, should you exist or not. And the only thing that people who wanted it taken away would say, well, of course we should have teacher placement because you know we're, we're all faculty and we think we should have jobs, but no one else deserves that opportunity. 
So we talk a little bit about free choice. Yeah. And Interesting. Sort of yeah. <laughs> and and then the other thing is when the job market turns mm -hmm. down and, and it's hard on the students. It is. And it's hard on the parents because yes. uh, in uh, particularly the areas that are, were in high demand, uh, I've had parents and students both come in and say, look, four years ago the market was great. I heard, you know, if I invested in education and now my son or my daughter cannot get a job and what are you doing about it? And, uh, you know, you can't change the job market because you want it to change. And so there's not an talk, opening. We would talk about what are your alternatives? What, first of all, I like to see what has a student done. Well, in many cases, the ones that were unemployed hadn't done very much. Sure. They were waiting for somebody to come wake them up some morning and offer them a job. Right. And so we had lots of training sessions on what are the alternatives to on-campus recruiting. You know, telephone solicitation, information interviews. You go in and say, well, I'm not looking for a job, but I want your advice about how to get a job in your field because I've always wanted to work here. And if you make a nice... Uh, you know, impression. It appears it that you've got some more, inform you have more information sessions now for uh, how to dress or, you know, and that, is that, um, or did you always have well, some I of think those? We d Maybe they're more advertised Yeah, now. they are more advertised, but there was a time, very honestly, when we didn't have to. The students from the upper classmen learned they, if you want a job, you put a suit and tie on, you get a haircut and you so forth. And I didn't hesitate back in the 60s to go up to a student and say, you know, with that beard, you're not liable to get a job, so why don't you shave? And, and I would no longer think about that right. in the later years because I'd get sued. You know, I was discriminating. And I was just giving them one-on-one -on -one advice. Yeah. So we started, Just a tip on the side. Yeah, yeah. Well, so we started having formal sessions. And of course, the ones who came frequently didn't need to come. Right. And the ones who still look like heck, <laughs> <laughs> they never showed up and wondered right. why. I was what about there. alumni? We ever did yes, we, in fact, my first job, as I said, was to do with part-time and summer placement, but I also worked with John Feinler, who was doing alumni placement. In, uh, out of the uh, out of alumni the, association? No, out of our office, oh, out, of okay. the, out of the placement service. And we, again, it was a manual process. We had these index things with uh, little uh, uh, plastic things, and we would put cards with a summary on the thing, and somebody would call up and say, uh, I need a, um, a management or humanities students for sale. So I'd go to the humanities book and I'd flip through and see what somebody had. And I said, well, yeah, I've got three that, that match that sort of thing. And uh, we can, uh, we can send then you, you put the in resume. Touch. And we'd, we'd make a copy of the resume and send it to them. And uh, that was pretty common. But rather than go through their whole resume, uh, the problem was trying to keep those current, and some people looked every year that I was here. You know, they were always on the job market, and you got tired of referring because you knew that they were not, gonna stay. not really looking. And frankly, we were open on Saturday mornings, and we'd get alumni come in back for a football game or something. And I can recall one young man that came in on a Saturday that I was working, and he kept kind of looking over his shoulder at the door, and his wife was out there, and when she got out of earshot, he said, you know, I'm really happy where I am, but my wife hates it there and she wants me to look for a job, so I'm talking to you, but I'm going to tell her uh, there's nothing available for us where you want. <laughs> <laughs> Would you back me up, right? Yeah, so back me up. <laughs> oh, all kinds. But we were open for many Saturdays. That's another thing I changed. I realized we weren't getting mail service and I was spending, you know, and my staff were spending Saturdays, half days Saturdays for virtually nothing. We couldn't even answer mail on those days. So changed it. We also, from a national perspective, the um, National Association, which was called the College Placement Council, had a program for alumni that they computerized through a computer at General uh, Electric in, in Pennsylvania. And, you know, they, we'd tell alumni to get on board with that, and they would do a scan of whatever database they had and then send out the resumes. So. I got the idea maybe we should do something similar for students. So we had ADPC, you know, concoct a program, and it did not mail the resumes, but it provided data to the students. And it was taken over nationally, and the idea was a student would fill out a little card saying, graduating in May of such and such, have a degree in so and so, my interests are, and we would uh, put that on a card, weekly ship it out and it would come back and here are the printouts for the students of what companies are coming and what date so you might want to interview them or they're not coming but here's a mailing address so that was 
Yeah, that's pretty fairly successful. Yeah, that's yeah. good. Any yeah. follow up? And you issue a lot of rep you had to do a report. Well, did you, if you we did us? for the vice president, we uh, the report Lynn Kaysen did was one page. I mean, he was very much to the point. We had X students, Y interviews, and salaries averaged. And uh, the, but we, each year it seemed to expand, and we ended up with doing a lot more. In fact, right now I was just in the office and they're doing follow-up surveys for students who didn't have anything when they graduated at the end of the first semester and they're now following up saying, what's the status, can we help you? And that, that's, I think, a Yeah, that's, it's service. good to keep in touch like that. Yeah, I and think. if the kids don't know, the parents sure do, and they'll tell you <laughs> whether they're happy or <laughs> it's not. It's a member of the team, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, they're also, another thing too, they talk about fluctuations in the job market, yeah. what's hot and what's not hot, yeah. and that certainly can impact on it you. It does, and uh, sometimes it's uh, a precursor of good things to come, and sometimes it, it tells you that, gee, this might not be where you should go if job interest is only why, the only reason you're in college, this might not be the major that's going to do that for you. I mean, like right now, well, I guess worldwide, certainly not just this country, nurses are in such tremendous demand that right. they, you, if you're breathing and you walk in, you can probably get a job. Right, yeah, absolutely. Uh, how about you know, a couple things? Um, I was gonna, there used to be the occupational outlook, outlook thing, and yeah. what, what was the, per and that sort of died, didn't it? Yeah, it did. In fact, Anita Stobol, uh, was very active in getting that started. Um, um, we felt when she was in your office. Yeah, when she was in our office, uh, sh we felt that students really need to think about a job before they graduate. I mean, not seen last semester of the senior year when oh my gosh I'm getting out of here in two weeks now what am I going to do? And so the idea it was patterned somewhat after the old master's program but it was more specific in bringing recent graduates from Purdue back to talk about their experiences at not only at Purdue, but how they got where they are and what they hope to what's do. What's future. going on there. Yeah, yeah. and uh, that, that, was, that was a good program, and mm -hmm. a lot of it was geared toward women uh, initially, because Danita, when she came over from Dean of Women, the idea was to get women to understand that there were careers out there, and more and more women were saying, well, gee, I'm not just gonna teach, or I'm." not just going to get married and have kids, I want a career. And so, right. and it, it served its purpose, but right. it, it, again, certain things... For that occurred, time for in which it time. operated. And then and now, you know, uh, women are pretty much attuned and they're, they're right. very good about it. What about, this. talk about the, the name change. How did well, that? the most recent name change, after com uh, placement service for men came the Uni university placement service, and then when we got up to, I guess it was when Tony Hawkins was uh, the acting vice president, we were talking about placement is a word that implies I'm going to do something for you, I'm going to place you. And what we really should be talking about is your career, because the statistics show that the average college graduate will have seven or eight different careers, not jobs or promotions, but different career paths while they work. And so we thought it was appropriate that students know this sort of thing. And so we argued over what's the name. And almost every college and university in the country had the word placement in there at some point. But one by one, they dropped them off. We were one of the last ones because we still believe that placement is an important thing. And if we can sure. help get a job, that's fine. Right. Uh, but I think it was probably Tony that came up with the idea, well, let's, how about Center for Career Opportunities, because that implies you're going to have a job and you're going to have a career and you're going to have some opportunities that can be helped. So that, that, that came in at that time. Yeah, it seems we really had a couple of other names in mind, but the acronyms didn't really <laughs> That's work too good on paper, <laughs> so we, we quickly got rid of those because yeah. we knew what students would do with right. them. Right. Then you had in diversity. Uh, diversity, uh, particularly, well, the, the women thing started after we became the University Placement Service. For minorities, of course, you remember that if you go back, I don't know how many years were you, have you been at Purdue? Uh, from it'll be 40 years. Okay. Well, back in the 50s, you know, we didn't even have minority football players until Lamar Lundy and some of those came along. Sure. So there weren't minorities on campus. Uh, in 1969, I hired uh, a young man who was one of the first football players, and his name is Tommy Fletcher. He play, came from the high school as Lamar, same high school as Lamar Lundy, and Tommy was hired to make an impact on the diversity thing. And when I hired him, I said, your role is to bring minority students one way or another to see what is available for them, and I hope you're successful enough that you work yourself out of a job. That was his mission. 
and Tommy and worked for me from 69 until probably sometime in the 80s, and that was that was his role. What did he do? What, did he leave? He, yeah, he did. He, actually, he took early retirement when he turned 59 and a half. He, he huh. had left. But Tommy started out, uh, you know, playing football here and then did a number of things, uh, including working for the Job Corps down at Camp Atterbury and so forth. But then he... In other words, he'd had employment before he came, yes, before he you did. learned. Yeah, he had been out in the employment world. And then he uh, joined the Black Muslim, so he changed his name. And he was Tommy X, which gave some people, you know, how do we handle this, which was to talk about diversity, how are we going to handle it? And, it, and he was... Uh, um, Tommy X for a number of years, and then as he went through the Muslim uh, experience, he became uh, Tamin Abdul Rahman. And uh, employers sometimes were, you know, this was when the Black Panther movement was uh -huh. active and so forth. But, but he did, was it, he really enhanced that? Yeah, I, right. he did, uh, but he did it in, in unconventional ways. But he ways. had business experience too yes, as a back. Yes, he had worked for the YMCA, he'd worked for the Job Corps, and he had taught some. Right. Uh, his name's still in a couple of record books for, he was a football player, pretty sure. football well, player. Good. But he'd go over to the co-rec, or in those days the Lambert Fieldhouse, and play basketball with the kids and use that as an opening of, well, why don't you come see me at the office? Yeah, that's very that good. Kind of How about some uh, interview tips? Did you have, will you share those with you, with us? Or people oh. that you pass along well, to the students? Well, I, I hope they're valid still, but uh, yeah, I did a lot of training of corporate recruiters. Uh, back in the 70s, I was asked to do some work for an advertising agency out of New York who specialized in communication for um, companies trying to hire people. And that led to, uh, well, I ran a couple of programs here at Purdue for training recruiters, small things. And Purdue was not particularly um, supportive of the effort. I could do it for free, but anything that was generated didn't go to my office. So I matched up with this company that I'd done some work on doing career guidance stuff, and they would put it in recruiting brochures. And uh, the owner of the company and I and a couple others ran uh, recruiter seminars for about 17 years where we'd try and teach employers how to do it because there were some terrible things going on. And we in that re interview? In, in terms of interview sure. technique, right. illegal questions, unsensitive sorts of things. And so we... Uh, we, in addition to writing a, a book called the campus or the 30 minute the campus connection I'm sorry which was a written publication that we sold to corporations we also did a videotape where we uh, talked oh that's a, nice because a, you a can panel and then we had students uh, I wrote the script for the whole 30 it was called the 30 minute decision because most recruiters okay. have 30 minutes to make a decision and so I laid out what should happen and how it should happen and then we would do vignettes of how not to do it and how to do it. And we, we uh, videotaped this down at the University of Virginia. And we had some really great things, but nobody could follow the script. There were no teleprompters. So we said, let's, here's what we want to do in this next scene. And so you students that we paid to come in and have mock interviews for their own practice sake, and the recruiters, here's what's going to happen. So you just handle it as if it were a real interview. And we got some absolutely beautiful things. Oh, that, mm -hmm. do you, uh, do you is it still being used? or? Yes. Well, you know, that was 1970-something. Oh, okay. But similar. So, yeah, my granddaughters laugh about it because it was pretty stilted from their point of view. <laughs> but I remember we had a businessman come in and play the role of a recruiter, and we had a very attractive electrical engineering student at Virginia. And he sat there in his pompous old way, and he did what I know some recruiters have done. Well, you're a good-looking woman. Why do you want to be an engineer? Why don't you just get married? And, you know, we use that as, this is what you shouldn't do. And then I use the same tape for students and say, here's the other end of it. This is what they're thinking, and this is how much time they have. And you'll have about two minutes of chit-chat, and don't think it's just chit-chat because they're going to measure how you respond to an unexpected question then they're going to ask you questions for 15 or 20 minutes. And they should ask you questions that are not yes and no answers. And then we give examples of, well, did you enjoy your summer job? And that's a yes, no question. Tell me about your summer job and what you liked about it and why, what you didn't and why. And so we would go through all of that with student groups. I spent a lot of evenings in residence halls and classes and so forth giving that little spiel. Were you ever a fact fellow at all? Yes, Tarkington oh. Hall for about 10, 11 years. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah. All right. And uh, that was a good experience. Yes. I was not like some of the fact fellows who 
daily almost. I seen that's, that's where they supplemented their income by eating there all the time. Uh, I was very busy. Uh, I was commanding officer of the local reserve unit, the 209th, which I know has been put over in Iraq a couple times. Fortunately, they didn't send us over to Vietnam, but they could have. And I was very active in church, and I, you know, I helped start Big Brothers and Big Sisters, not only of Lafayette, but of, of uh, the state of Indiana. In, uh, the chapter, did you? Yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, we, yeah it, it, it's and, still going, though. Yeah. And uh, also was active at Wesley Foundation, so I had a chance to work with young people there, and many of them would come in for things. I taught a Sunday school class, and sometimes students would come in. And say, Lots of community activities. I just got, yeah, I got to the point of thinking maybe I spend more time in the community than with my own children. They were growing up, and I was, I was working in Big Brothers as president for, <laughs> I think I was on the board for 10 or 11 years. Uh, I was, let's talk about kids. family then. Yeah. Where are your children? Um, well, our, we had two daughters. Mm-hmm. Um, the older one, Marta, is the engineer, and she's still working over in Kokomo. Uh, she's, you know, worked for them in Kokomo and in Europe, and finally decided to get uh, out of engineering because she just wasn't happy with what was going on, and she was going to quit. I said, you know, Purdue has a, an international MBA, executive MBA for engineers. So she ended up getting an MBA through Cranert in Rouen, France, which was not that far a drive from Luxembourg. So she came back, and they said, well, we've got a good engineering job for you in Kokomo, and she said, uh, no, and they said, well, we, you know, we can't do this, we can't make you from an engineer to a business person, and she said, well, you'll lose not only me, but my husband, who has, I think, six or seven patents on stuff for them, so they found a place for her, and she's still doing business planning for the company. Uh, for, for in Kokomo, she's still yeah. mm-hmm. oh, okay. Which is the headquarters for the uh, uh, Delco Electronics Division of Delphi, oh. and it was spun off from General Motors, sure. it's not General Motors anymore. Okay. And you, where's your other daughter? The other daughter, um, Marta always wanted to go to Purdue. She was very bright, wanted to be a, an engineer, you know. Her, I can recall when she was about in fifth or sixth grade, I said, you know, typical career type, what do you want to do? Oh, I want to be a nurse or a teacher. I said, well, that makes sense. Your mother is both a, a nurse and a professor of nursing. Uh, what about being a doctor or an engineer? You're, you're pretty good at that. Oh, I can't do that, Dad. Why not? Just I'm a girl. Only boys can be engineers and doctors. So I did a little career counseling, and by the time she was getting ready for high school, she was taking courses at Purdue, and I said, well, you can go anywhere you want to be an engineer. We'll support you, within reason. I mean, I, we'd have to get some maybe scholarship money. And she said, why would I want to go anywhere else? I've been taking courses at Purdue, and I like it, and I know I can do it. So she did. Second daughter, Janice. I'll go anywhere but Purdue. I want a small school. She's an actress. She wanted to go to a small school, so she went to St. Olaf in Minnesota, mm. acting major. Okay. What is she doing now? Well, <laughs> uh, she, she graduated from and, there. She came back and got a degree from management in industrial relations, and they didn't know how to handle her because she was in a thing called, um, oh, whatever they called it. It was based on the tutorial uh, system in. Uh, England where you didn't go to class. You just had tutorials with faculty and oh, papers. Okay. So she didn't have any grades, but she had reams of comments from her faculty. So when she applied to Cranert, they said, but what are your grades? And she said, I didn't get grades. I did tutorials. And uh, so that gave them, they said, well, we'll put you on conditionally. And uh, she ended up taking a job for a computer company in town as a customer service person. And Cranert didn't have a part-time degree, but every semester she would drop a course or two and made it a part-time program, and every semester they said, you can't do that. But she finally got her master's, went to Chicago for a a small engineering firm, became their manager of uh, benefits and and, uh, wage and salary and benefits, and then decided, too much work, I want to have a life, so she moved to North Carolina, took a job with Progress Energy as an individual contributor in the area of salary administration. Eight weeks after she was there, they fired her boss and made her the direct, or made her the manager of compensation for a Fortune 50 company. Mm, decided that was just not going well, so she's now director of uh, compensation and benefits for a small electronics firm in Durham, North Carolina. So. She likes it better on the smaller side, and maybe. Uh, the bureaucracy of a utility company that's as big as Progress Energy, which owns everything from 
yeah. Florida, along the East Coast. Uh, you just couldn't get a decision made. And she is with a company where it was started by a couple of faculty members from North Carolina State Engineering Department, and they're small enough that they can handle it. Yeah, yeah. right. Okay. So anyway, they're they're both professionals. Yeah. Doing well. Yeah, you got a couple of awards. You got the Alumni Association Award. Yeah, that night. was one of the biggest surprises. One of the two biggest surprises in my life. The uh, the Boilermaker Special Award and the way they did it. Jack Carroll, you, who you might know. Sure. One day I was working away in 1998 and there was commotion out and I went out and there was Jack dressed up and here was this big wheel, like Wheel of Fortune or whatever they call it, and you spell out words. I thought, what are they doing here? So I, I was being polite, and my staff was trying to guess what the words were. Well, it spelled out Boilermaker Special. And that's how I found out that I'd been selected to get the <laughs> award that year. But I, I think the whole thing was spelled out before I don't know, because I didn't think it had anything to do with me. I thought they were just having fun. So, uh, they give that at the half t they give that at the football game. Yeah, right? I right. stood on the, I've got a video standing uh, on the 50 yard line at the Iowa game in 1998. Yeah. And there were four or five. That's kind of nice. Year. I think yeah. it's a good thing that, that they do. That was a really wonderful award. And, uh, yeah. So. And you got the uh, college placement, college division, of, or you got the uh, fellow from the college placement council. Well, I, I was, uh, yeah, I am. Um, You've been involved with that I too, was the first, as you said earlier. I, I was the first fellow. Uh, there was one industry member and one college member, and uh, I was the first college person that became a fellow of the academy. And that was, th that was, that was kind That's of a surprise nice. too. That's very nice, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um, and Sagamore of the Wabash was another surprise because... How did they I, let you know about that? It was at my retirement and uh, President Beering was there and I said, oh, that's nice of him to come and then he opened this thing and said, well, I've got a gift for you or I've got something for you and I, I truly was speechless and I'm rarely speechless but I, I had not had a clue that this was going to happen. So it's it's hanging on my wall. And no, around. and they have to bow to you. Cause, and you can also tell people that there's a room, you have a room at Purdue Naval. Yeah, the Sagamore room. Yeah. And that's correct. <laughs> that's correct. They're like saying, we just had lunch. I had lunch with some of the staff <laughs> there today. Oh, have you so, participated all in the alumni uh, in any fashion? Not really. Okay. Um, the alumni try to ask people uh, Well, I didn't when I was here because I had so many other things going, you know the military and the Big Brothers and the faculty fellow and, and teaching things. Sunday school and singing in a choir and all that sort of stuff. And uh, I just really didn't get into it because I felt I was part of the Alumni Association right. with our alumni placement activities. Right. And now that I'm in Colorado, you know, the nearest one is in Denver and there aren't very many folks there. Well, there are a few. I keep running into them, but they're not members of the association. So, no, I, I have not been as uh -huh. active as I Let's thought talk a little about be. retirement. What, what have you been doing? And oh, did you okay. take early retirement? or? Uh, I was 64 and a half, but I was on a partial early retirement. And uh, we had bought a place in Colorado in the mountains. When my daughter and her husband went to Luxembourg, they sold their property because they didn't know they were coming back to Indiana. And so I said, gee, you know, we come here for vacation every year. What if we bought a place? Well, I couldn't really swing the whole thing without humongous payments. So I said something to Marta and she said, well, gee, we've got cash that's either going to go on a CD for when we come back or something. I said, well, how would you like to be a partner? So they're partners in our house in, in Summit County. Uh, up in the ski area, and they, they love it. And uh, so, having two homes, we live in Colorado Springs, but we also go up two hours into the mountains. To when we were first retired, it was a lot of hiking and cross country uh, skiing and that sort of thing. But as you get older, you know the knees are not as good as they are, and <laughs> I don't mind just enjoying the just scenery. being there, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but I, in terms of what I do. When we're in are there any Colorado other Springs. people from Purdue that are in the close proximity that you see uh, out there? Yeah, in fact, my next door neighbor's sister went to Purdue. One of the ministers at our church, his husband was a Purdue engineering graduate. A woman that we met at a church function was um, also a Purdue graduate. And so we keep running into Purdue people, none of whom are active in the, in, in the Alumni Association, but they're there. And we took a couple of tours with the Alumni Association when they were doing uh, sure. tour, tours to Europe. Met a woman up in Denver that we're now good friends with because she was there for the same reason. And yeah. so we it's sort of nice to build up your relationships yeah, out there. Yeah, it is. And, and my own personal involvement, the only thing I'm really into right now, and I never did any of this at Purdue, uh, I joined a choir. That's about a 90 
voice choir. We've cut four CDs, um, doing stuff like Messiah and Elijah and. Is it with a church or? Yeah, it's a church choir. Very good. I think they're pretty good. In fact, they're going to uh, Rome to participate in the International uh, Church Music Choir in 2009. I'm not sure I'm ready to do that because not enough people can afford the cost and the time, and I'm not a soloist. So <laughs> I've already told the director, you know, I love singing yeah. with you, <laughs> but I like to have 16 other tenors. <laughs> right. I want to sing with the group. I want to sing with the group, not right. be a soloist. But right. When yeah. I was at St. Andrew, we went to St. Andrew for many, many years. Uh -huh. and, um, we had 16 in the choir, and we have 17 tenors in this choir, so it's a really wonderful yeah, musical experience. Yeah, that's very nice. Yeah. Uh, let's see, um, how about an outstanding event in your life you got? One outstanding like event. I would have to say it was meeting my wife and getting married after such a short okay. time. I mean, my wife doesn't like me to say we only dated for 16 days, but I mean, we knew each other about 90 days, but we only dated for 16, and then we didn't see each other until right before the wedding. It That's was, okay. And that happened in the sweet shop. So this morning <laughs> I went in and had a cup of coffee in the sweet shop. See where my name is on the plaque, right? Well, yeah, it's just, it, it, it means a lot. I mean, I met some really neat people. Uh, Do you have a fond that, memory for doing anything special or a tradition well, that sticks in your mind? Uh, I, I guess what sticks in my mind is how much change there's been. Because when I was a freshman, I was proud to wear a little green beanie as a freshman and do what I was told to do, right. and so, wear a cord, cords when I was a senior. You still got your cords? No, I don't fit into them for one thing. But, uh, and by then I'd been married a few years, so uh -huh. it wasn't quite the same as when I was single. But uh, the traditions at Purdue, you know, learning the cheers and, you know, E, D, D, X, D, Y, D, X, E, D, X, D, Y, and, you know, cosine, secant, tangent, sine. People don't do that sort of thing anymore. Do you go so. to football games when you're here? Every football, home football game except one in 30-some years. That's very good. And uh, we didn't go to that one because I had a niece getting married, and I thought it would be appropriate yeah. to go to her wedding. So, <laughs> and, uh, in closing, any com comments that you'd like to share with us, the researchers about the placement office and the career? Oh, I've probably skipped over a lot of stuff, but I think it's a very important function, and I have historically had, for, historically fought for more space because we are terribly cramped there. and. We could not have run the office without the technological advances of the computer and the internet in the space that we're allotted. And I, I know it caused the library staff a great deal of grief when we took the women's restroom off of the hallway. I don't remember that. That Where? was in 1970. Well, it was a private little. Oh, bathroom maybe. I, well, it's been a while. For the women. Okay. And there was one woman who was very irate. I mean, we really needed the space, and. Um, well, what? We were told, I was at a meeting in Reno, Nevada, and I got a phone call from uh, Jim Blakesley, the space guy, said, you know, the library is going to vacate this space, and I'm giving you first dibs on it. And so I said, yes, you know, sight unseen, any square footage would be fine with me. And uh, when I got back, I got in trouble with my boss, because he said, that should have gone through me. You had no authority to say you wanted that space. And but you got, you got it anyway, I, right, I, yeah. yeah. But, the things that have changed, uh, Dean Potter was great about recommendations and faculty evaluations, and that was wonderful at the time because it was small faculty, small students, they knew each other, but he required every student to have written recommendations every year or twice a year. When I took over, Lynn Kaysen still had it, but we had 10 file cabinets jammed full of stuff going all the way back into the 30s, and nobody ever asked for them. And so I looked at a few of them, and I won't name a name, but there was a, an astronaut, one of our astronauts, who was pretty famous at the time. I looked at his recommendation by the engineering faculty and said, average student, average grades will probably go in the military. Uh, is this stuff worth really having 10 file cabinets of? And I looked at a few others of people I knew, and I thought, that might have worked in 1920 or 1930, but it certainly doesn't work in the 60s. Students the times no change faculty, and the focus. Faculty change, student fame, you don't have, you know, when you have big lectures and instead of small classes, it really changes right, things. Right, yeah. So we did away with them. But Bill LeBold, who you probably know, when he found out I had these 10 file count, he says, oh, I think I could do a wonderful research things with this. And I said, as long as you take them out of my office. So the last I heard, Bill put them in the attic of the mechanical engineering building, and they've probably never been touched since they <laughs> moved out of here. So, it, uh, but it's been a, it, it's, uh, Purdue is a wonderful community, uh, very supportive, uh, but it has changed so drastically. When I came on board, Fred Hubdy was president. 
Don Mallett was vice president for students. Uh, R.B. Stewart was vice president and treasurer. And somebody else was academics. I mean, there were like four people running the university. And I felt I was one step from the top. I don't know that I could get within <laughs> a lot more people. A hundred steps of the top now. So it, it felt like a community, and, and you know, I don't, it's grown a lot. It has, and right. it has. And to the be campus that way. space. It has to. Uh, on my twenty, on our twenty-something wedding anniversary, my wife and I went to the old Sarge Bilts, and if you remember them, there were a lot of single and two people tables set up, and I sat down, and Fred and Priscilla came in, and they acted as if they had joined us for our anniversary. Yeah. You know, that doesn't happen. No, these that's, days. It's different, yeah. That's and, and first of all, the president wouldn't go out in a public <laughs> restaurant like that. He'd be mobbed, <laughs> or she would be mobbed. So. Uh, so it's changed a lot. Some of it for the good, some of it, you know, not right. so good. But it's, it's still a challenge, and it's, you know, the community yeah. has grown a lot. Both the cities have, as well as the university. Yes, it has tremendously. But yeah. uh, it's still very important to me. I still feel that I'm a loyal Boilermaker, even right. if I don't belong to the association, because there's not that much going on in my sure. part of the world, but, but I sure do run into Purdue people everywhere, yeah, and they good. all speak highly of it. Right. I think this concludes the end of round. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you very much. Well, this I hope we covered what you want to cover. Yes, you do. Uh, it's very nice, it's very helpful, and our researchers that are studying the university can benefit quite a bit by okay. it. And also for the anniversary for 2014. We're planning yes. to be there. I don't know. Yeah, well, I am too, <laughs> but Lord willing, I'll be there, but I don't know. Thank you, Brian.